in the early 1980s, I was at Northern Illinois University teaching Judo, Hatha Yoga, and related courses in the physical education department. An Army captain, Dan Tobin, contacted me, and I was recruited into an organization called Task Force Delta. It later inspired the movie Men Who Stare at Goats. I was 35 years old at the time. By then, the CIA, the NSA, the DIA, Lawrence Livermore, and the Army were spending billions of dollars trying to find out how the Chinese were producing thousands of 8- to 14-year-old psychic kids. They call them super psychics, and the Army wanted to tap in to what they were doing and weaponize it. Now, there was another reason, much less discussed and quite embarrassing to the Army. Colonel George Walton summarized it in his 1965 book, The Wasted Generation. Half the young men tested back then for selective service were too fat, maladjusted, or illiterate to serve, and the other half could only serve because we lowered the standards enough to accommodate their flabby bodies and unlettered minds. In 1973, Colonel Walton wrote The Tarnished Shield, publisher's weekly set of it. It's a sobering indictment. In Walton's findings, the degeneration of our armed forces is unquestionable and reflects the gross, self-pitying, permissive society it represents. The American soldier today is insubordinate, drug-ridden, resentful, and ashamed. So the Army turned to Colonel Jim Channon to solve the problem. And for Colonel Channon, it was simple. Just create an army of warrior monks. He was a real deal. Army infantry, 20 years, two tours in Vietnam, CIB. He did it all, and he had street cred with the World War II generation. But he was born in 39, so he was much younger than most of them. The last of the World War II generation were born on 2 September 1945 when the war ended. So Colonel Channon was young enough in the 1970s, late 70s, that he could slip into the new age generation baby boomers and learn some of what they were doing. Now he understood that the Chinese were thousands of years ahead of us. Their religions included internal training. But how are we going to translate that, even if we come to understand it, into something that we can use in our Western world? Kundalini, for instance, the coiled serpent crawling up the spine to illuminate us. How would we translate that into the Western consciousness? Well, he said, we own it. This image is from the Vatican. Ajna chakra, the dot on the forehead, the pineal gland. It's ours. We just don't understand. It's all dead ritual. But we own it. We're simply oblivious. Now this all sounded far-fetched, of course, to many of the army leaders back then who gave Task Force Delta its wings. They were real deal soldiers, brave, noble, brilliant. But the New Age generation was outside their known universe. And it didn't take long for Task Force Delta to start looking more like their world. Less emphasis on the warrior monk and more on technology and the army world as they knew it. Here's an example. This is a document produced out of a, one of the meetings up at uh, Fort Lewis in Washington. These are some of the topics. North Korean Light Infantry Brigades, Consolidating Communications Technology, blah, blah, blah. Not much here for the warrior monk. Now, I was a silent member of this thing. You won't see my name anywhere except on the member roster. But I knew a couple of the guys. I knew Dan Tobin, of course. And I knew Bob Spear, who was more active. You see his name at the bottom. He was one of the proponents of combatives. So I watched all this come and go. 
I was born less than two weeks after the end of World War II. So I'm a tween. I'm about as close as you can get to the World War II generation, and I'm nine months ahead of the baby boomers. So I lived in both worlds. I saw the New Age generation close up. This is Yogi Raj Sri Swami Satchinananda, for instance. Here he is at Woodstock. I trained with him 10 days at Montecito, California. I knew Swami Rama, I met him before. I knew who he was, I followed his work. He's the one who stopped his heart over at the Menner Foundation. Gave us a lot to think about in terms of autonomic control. I never met Mahesh Yogi, but I spent quite a bit of time down at Fairfield at the university that he uh, created. I was down there when thousands of young people were coming there to learn how to fly. I watched. I listened. I studied the uh, Scientology movement. Same thing. Follow us. You can learn to fly. And there was all the music back then, the mantras. And then New Age music itself began to blossom. People like Steve Halperin connecting it all. Sacred geometry, chakras, vibration, all of this mixed together. And then the cannabis added a, a whole dimension to it all. But floating above it and shading the whole movement was Vietnam. 150,000 wounded, 60,000 killed, 1,244 still missing. Two million civilians on both sides of Vietnam. These were the images that we saw. Then came My Lai, hundreds slaughtered. We lost our way. We became killers. So much to see. The average age of a soldier back then, an American soldier, was 21. A lot of 18-year-olds. This is what they saw. And this is what they lived with. So a lot of them began to smoke weed. When they brought it home, it just got bigger and bigger. Now, during the early and mid-70s, I was at the University of Iowa studying exercise science and teaching yoga, judo, and such. But my interest was in how to train hundreds and thousands of people to get really good at moving, to think as one. I looked to people like Henry, uh, Floyd Henry Alport, father of experimental social psychology, World War I veteran. He had this idea about social facilitation. Under certain conditions, groups of individuals can learn faster, move better, um, perform at a higher level. But it wasn't easy to figure out. There were a lot of variables, and I wanted to crack the code. I wanted to learn how to teach lots of people to do increasingly complex movements at one time. Then there was spontaneous synchronization. It's where diverse populations, um, all moving in weak interaction with one another, evolve spontaneously to move as one, to think as one. I wanted to understand how that occurred. And I practiced. And I wanted to know how to teach others how to teach it what it looked like, what it felt like. And then I wanted to understand transpersonal physical readiness training. This deals with the journey that we take as our bodies are transformed from childhood toys into adult tools and finally into transcendent temples. This all happened in the United States one time from 1885 or so to 1920. It was called the golden era of American physical culture. In this time, millions of young men 
began to understand that their bodies indeed are temples and should be treated like such. They didn't have their own system of physical training, but they borrowed from the European systems that our ancestors brought over from the old countries. Now this all started for me at the age of eight. I was German Catholic, that's me second to the left, back when Catholicism was more serious. I spent hours on my knees praying and I wanted to be a knight. Knights weren't cartoons back then. They were real and they were worth striving to become. These were the images we saw. Today we would consider this inappropriate for children. Saint Bavo, he props up his book on a human skull. I wanted to know what he read and how he got that halo. These were my holy cards back then. Saint Paul the Apostle with his book and his sword. Knowledge and power. I was all in. I grew up in Davenport, Iowa, settled by Germans in the mid 1800s. This was a German Turner Hall. The centerpiece was a large gym. Next to it was an opera hall. Music, motion, and mindfulness. I trained there till I was in high school and it burned down. These guys were warriors, philosophers. They were my ancestors. That's my great grandfather on the left and my grandfather on the right. This is the gym that they all built, the Turner Hall where I grew up training. The motto was sound mind and sound body, men sano in corpore sano. There they are marching off out of Davenport to fight for the North in the Civil War. The Turners were known for the high levels of fitness and their willingness to serve. This is the Indianapolis Turner Hall, both men and women train. Functional beyond anything we have today and much more organized. It was all inspired by Friedrich Ludwig Jahn. He was German, a patriot. He studied Gutzmutz. Gutzmutz read Greek and Latin. This is what he said in the 1700s. This is Jan building one of his first courses called the Hasenhide. He used Gutzmutz principles. Nothing like it today. Now Gutzmutz studied Mercurialis. And Mercurialis studied the Greeks. So these were the Turners down there in their defensive posture. They were at the forefront of rallying against the oppression of the monarchs and the French during the, the Napoleonic Wars. Now the Turner Halls grew bigger and bigger. Thousands became fit through this training. Eventually, as they began to migrate to the West, they brought their system. This is around 1904, German Turners, I think it's in St. Louis, thousands. This is Hermann Kurler, second generation German, the, mo the father of modern army fitness. He was hired in 1885 to be the master of the sword of West Point. That's his uncle, George Brocious on the right, they originally wanted him, but he said, no, hire my nephew, Herman, down on the left. He's younger and much better than I. This is the first international gymnastics team, American, that went to Stuttgart in the 1882. This is where they train, Brocious and Curler, in the Milwaukee Training Hall. Brocious was in charge of all the training for the Turners and hundreds came here to be trained. This is Herman Keller, late in his career, still training even at the age of 50 and 60. He created physical training that is unparalleled today. Minimum effort, 
maximum efficiency. Med balls, body weight training, off the ground training, rope climbing. Look at the precision, look at the beauty. They figured it out. Social facilitation, spontaneous synchronization, boxing, wrestling. Well, the Danish had a good system too. And so did the French and the Swedes. They all brought these systems to the United States. So beautiful, so elegant. And what you notice is they all look alike because they're all learning to move properly, to move well. Yale University group training. This is uh, uh, Aaron Mullineau Hewlett, the head of the first head of the Harvard gym, with his med balls, dumbbells, weighted bar, Indian clubs, and boxing gloves. This is uh, this is the University of Northern Iowa. Here you see women doing things that today we would say all oh, only men can do. This is a combination of both German and Swedish equipment. We could spend an hour looking at what we see here and how it was used. Swedish vaulting buck, German parallel bars, pommel horse German, stall bars Swedish. This is a combination. Look at the order. Everybody's alert. Everybody's there. This is called calisthenic. It means beautiful strength. It was a word used to describe the women's physical training being produced in the 1800s. The term was eventually adapted for all exercise. But in the beginning, it had to be beautiful and it had to be strong. These are Czechoslovakia and Sokol. Look at the lines. Imagine, this is 1904, imagine trying to get a group of kids to take that photo today. They had to hold still. The cameras weren't as uh, sophisticated then. This is 1904 in uh, Kansas City. Carl Betts. You could handle about 100 people in a gym like this and everybody learned to fly. But eventually, things began to change. The lines began to get crooked. We began to make fun of people who went to these gymnasiums. They were called dummies. By 1924, here at the end of Iowa, in this demonstration, the lines were crooked, longer, no longer existing. We'd switch to sports, golf, tennis. This is from a 1932 magazine warning what would happen if we abandoned the Greek ideals and began to focus on the modern sports. But there was no room for the equipment then. We had to gut the gyms so we could play basketball and volleyball and tennis. And eventually all the equipment went away and the teachers went with it. And then the bleachers came. Now those teachers were kicked out onto the playgrounds and that's where the playground movement began. Teachers were out there to teach them. And when World War II began, we still had kids who could climb. Today those gyms are only museums now. But by 1940, pioneers of this old style training like Charles McCloy were calling for change. We should like to propose that as a profession we rethink the whole problem of our more purely physical objectives and that we emphasize them more. See, the moderns, the new people, said focus on sports and games. Forget about fitness. Mabel Lee, perhaps the most influential female physical educator of the 20th century, said the same thing.
So the war came and people like McCloy and Mabel Lee were called up to rebuild the doctrine for the U.S. Army, which had declined just like the civilian sector. So they put it all together, rebuilt it. Imagine trying to get a group of women to do that today, so beautifully, so articulate. The men also developed strong programs. Uh, social facilitation, spontaneous synchronization. They even developed a system of building using tools to build around them and using the same principles. But in 1957, we realized that we were losing ground. Eugene Kincaid, Pulitzer Prize winning author, Well, that shook us up again. So we began to promote manhood among our youth. This is a magazine from the early 50s. This is stuff I grew up reading. And along then came this new push to get kids fit. This is a 1953 California physical education guidelines. But look at their technique. These pictures are right out of the manual. The knees are buckled. There's no technical quality at all. No progression, no variety, no precision, no social facilitation, uh, no synchronization, and certainly no transpersonal vision. Same manual. Two students in the group that can do a good headstand. Spotters looking the other way. Now, the 60s under JFK was another good try, but it all died with him in Dallas. And as of today, this is us. These kids cannot move. They're locked up. They can't breathe. They're parakinetic. Now, other countries out there, our enemies, are using social facilitation to their advantage. Look at that picture. Look at the front row of the females. Look at their feet. They are up all at once on their toes. They are in sync. Look at that. Look at their toes pointing forward, their heads up. Yeah. Same thing with the men. And it translates into war fighting ability. I got a look at the North Koreans close up back in the 60s. I volunteered for the draft in 1967. And if you took a little time and stared into these faces, you'd see what Walton was talking about. That guy front and center is I, me. And I remember thinking, if I'm the best they have, we're in a world of hurt. There were a lot of unfit soldiers back then. But I'd grown up in those old systems and had no trouble with the physical training. I was assigned to Bravo Company, first to the 32nd Infantry. Just think MASH, but a little bit dirtier. Our base camp was just south of the barrier fence. I came as a specialist, but was quickly promoted to Sergeant E5 team leader. We manned the fence, and we patrolled the DMZ. The average age was around 21. A lot of these guys were barely 18 or 19. And we were up against some of the baddest son of a bitches in the world. A North Korean soldier. And 1968 was one of the most deadly times since the Korean War. They only sent their best soldiers, elite special operations guys. And there we were. I spent six months there, and we headed south to headquarters, division headquarters, and I got a job working in a gym. I lived in it and ran it. I was the non-commissioned officer in charge. Stayed there for six months, had a chance to rebuild, train in judo, go to the monasteries. I practiced judo since around 1960, so I began inviting some of the best instructors in the region and from the Kriya Yudo College to come and 
train in our gym. In 1982, I returned to Korea for another year, back up on the DMZ, to run all the gyms in the division as a civilian. I was out of place there with my long hair. This was 1982 when this sort of behavior wasn't appreciated by the military. I went back to visit the gym where I had once lived and now managed among the other gyms across the TMZ. One of the things that we tried to do in Delta Force was popularize motorcycles back then for units. And I found a couple that were confiscated in a drug raid and got them and put phony license plates on them and started using them around division headquarters. It's the first time we were using motorcycles since perhaps the Korean War, World War II. Didn't take long for the officers to discover it. They eventually took them away from me and they used them themselves. But I came back and continued training over the years, constantly practicing, studying, teaching. And then I was ready eventually for another journey. I took a Fulbright to Burma, 1988. The Hermit Kingdom, the longest visa back then was tourist. It was one week, no movie cameras allowed. This was called the Hermit Kingdom. I stayed nine months. They gave me cameras, a driver, video camera. I was all in. This was one of my classes. These are the cadre. Here we are going off to study martial arts. The army took notice. And they asked me to start training soldiers. I'm teaching a group of soldiers how to clean hair. But civil unrest shut the country down. Things turned violent. I was on the last plane out went to Thailand for the last three months, where once again I was immersed in Buddhist culture. I worked for the National Department of Physical Education of Thailand, once again training teachers, social facilitation, synchronization. Now the Berlin Wall went down in 89, so I figured and all those old things I studied as a kid were eventually going to come out because the East Europeans and Russians kept using them. But we had a problem. The United States had changed considerably and we were in awfully bad conditions, physically, mentally, and emotionally. This is right out of a 1980s Army PT manual. That's what a push-up looked like. This is out of the manual also. This is a soldier warming up to go run. Look at that body. Look at that. So I packed up a U-Haul full of functional training equipment and I headed on down to the Army Physical Fitness School of Fort Benning and I got myself a job as an instructor and a doctrine writer. And back then, push-up, sit-ups, two-mile run. That was it. That was my boss. I kid you not. And this is what it all looked like. I took these photos. That's what a push-up looked like. She was training to be an Army physical fitness leader. This one also. And this push-up counted. I watched him count it. And that's what it looked like. But the fitness school gave me a lot of freedom and the opportunity to explore what I wanted to learn and teach. These are rangers over at Audie Murphy Gym learning Indian clubs, just like Herman Curler taught them. Mass dumbbell drills near Jersey Guard, Fort Bliss. This was all unheard of back then, by the way, this idea of training for perfection like this. And it became clear right off to many that if it's done properly, it was easy. They just had to learn to do it properly. They had to learn how to teach. I eventually started teaching combat gymnastics like we used to teach during World War II. But 
but I found quickly that most soldiers couldn't even do a forward roll. Their spines are frozen, turned inside out from years of poor posture. So we had to start from scratch, do a lot of extension. They had to learn it, and then they had to learn to teach it. I introduced inversion boots. They became part of the MFT course for a while. But I got a lot of pushback back then, especially from our physical therapist, who said they were dangerous. We shouldn't be doing it. Inversion tables an hour approved by the FDA for medical treatment, but it didn't matter back then. Much of what I did was shut down as soon as I did it. But a lot of units picked up on it. This is over in San Diego working with BUDS instructors. This is working with youth groups for the National Guard Youth Challenge Program at Fort Stewart. Mechanized infantry. Now this is a unit down at Sand Hill, Fort Benning. I went out one day with one of our NCOs and we taught these uh, drill sergeants how to train them using the old system. Now look at his body. These deformities would, con would have been considered medical problems years ago, but we had to fix them as part of basic training. All these kids, all these problems, see. So we taught the drill sergeants how to do it, how to focus, progression, variety, precision, fingers, thumbs extended and joined, head up, eyes forward. Stretch the fingers, middle finger pointing forward, arm shoulder distance, okay. sit back on the heel, sink into the heel, toes forward, hands on top of the head, eyes open, relax. Now this unit got so good that their PT scores went beyond anything people had seen in those days and they were accused of cheating. So they retested and the scores were the same. This showed that with the right equipment and the right type of training, you could transform soldiers into warriors quite easily. And along with it came the discipline, the mindfulness that we wanted them to carry out of basic training. Now, eventually I was contacted by uh, Mick Bidnerick, Lieutenant Colonel Mick Bidnerick. I had known him in the Ranger community, and he was over at Fort Jackson where he had a, uh, a training battalion. I went over and with one of our NCOs and a group of these senior, a group of these uh, senior NCOs and drill sergeants and officers got together and we showed them some of these techniques like Indian clubs. Clubs, you can see from the bottom right, had been part of the Army doctrine since the 1800s, but had been forgotten. We taught them the medicine ball. There's Colonel Bignerick on the right. And they wanted to try this and see if it would work. So they got $150,000 or so to buy equipment and they wanted to try it. But as soon as that happened, my bosses sitting there took over and I never had anything to do with it. They, uh, all I did was take the photos you're looking at now. And that's how it went during my time at the Fort Benning Army Physical Fitness School. But I finally left because of Adam Larson. In 2000, February, I went to work one day and the Commandant called me and said, we got to get out to Sand Hill. I see the soldiers built these obstacle courses back when these soldiers had grown up on those high climbing devices we saw earlier. So they were confident on these things because they'd grown up on them as kids. This is a 40 foot tower. Called a banana, it's a banana rope, it's called Slide for Life. You climb up, you grab the rope, wrap your legs around the rope and come down. Adam Larson climbed up there, hung from that rope for a moment, couldn't get his legs around the rope, didn't have enough core strength, fell and died right there. And I was one of the guys charged with investigating his death. We climbed all the obstacles and looked at them and found what I already knew. Our kids shouldn't, shouldn't be on these things. 
Yeah, they were worn down and dangerous and poorly kept. But the only solution was to build nets under them. We didn't change the way we teach. And even over in Victory Tower at Fort Jackson, we just built a playground. Nothing to do with combat. More importantly, we just didn't teach them how to climb. And there they are, flailing away on these things. They fly over the obstacle and collapse in a heap. Well, Adam Larson's death convinced me it was time to roll. And if it was 14 to 18 year olds, I knew I had to get back closer to youth. So I took a job with the Iowa Department of Education. I was the head of all the health, PE, substance abuse prevention for the, all the schools in the state, subject matter expert, and set about to teach the same system. These boys are in a one week course. This is somewhere down in Georgia maybe, the uh, National Guard hired me to go around the country and work with youth, youth in, a, in a project called uh, Project Pass. Okay. Same principles, same challenge. How do you get them all to move as one? How do you get them to think as one, to become a team? How is it done? How do you get them to teach? How's that work? I took all these photos and I taught all these kids. This is a summer camp at Camp Dodge. This is out in Pennsylvania somewhere. And these aren't all highly fit individuals, but take a look. Anybody can do this. It just has to be approached properly. It has to be taught properly. Rhythm, mindfulness. Well, now we're to the present. Here we are. We could spend a lot of time talking about how this all came to be, but that's a whole other discussion, sad as it is. The future? Well, now we're meditating in the army, but <laughs> whether it makes any sense or not, <laughs> that's up to you. <laughs> that's up to you. The future? There's an old saying, Latin. I think it goes something like this. Prudence futuri tempura succedum calignose nocte prima deus. Wise gods cover with darkness of the night issues of the future. But it's a discussion we must have, and it should start soon.